All right, so I'm out of camera. You'll be able to see if it, if it clips right here on this input level. It's really, okay. it's really our yeah. character. This little light here, this is input level. Yeah. It'll turn red if it clips. Thank <laughs> you. 
some of the jazz influence that was um, beginning to, to, to make its way to Paris at that time, right? And I think you, you know part, parts of that where the rhythm, the jazz, these jazz rhythms come in, da 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 just the syncopation um, is his way of uh, infusing a little, a little, some jazz elements in there. But because it has such a, an energetic, um, you know, rhythm to it, I, I kind of want to see you embody that rhythm even before your first note. And so what I'd like to challenge you to do um, is, and, and I think with, with uh, players of your age, um, especially you know, um, players that are, are becoming um, very capable technically, but have uh, some rhythmic things that, that are still um, you know, tripping, tripping the technique that you've acquired up. Um, even when you're playing scales, what I'd like to recommend is that when you start a scale, let's just let's take it out of the context of this piece. Um, let's just let's take a F major scale, okay? And I want I want you to think. Let's let's imagine four four, and I want you to think one two three breathe play. Okay, so we're gonna breathe in time, and you don't need to play all. Just play one of a F major scale. Okay, so da 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 da. That's all I want. I just want I just want you to start it in. I want you to think time before you start playing, and then breathe in time which will make your entrance immediately start in time, okay? So I'll give you, I'll give you four, you breathe on four. I'll give you four beats, you'll breathe on the fourth one, and then come in, just play a beat, right? Okay, F major, one, two, three. Great, all right, let's do it one more time. Different tempo. Might be slower, might be faster. All the side. All right, one, two, three. Yeah, but I saw you go. One, two, <gasps> da, 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 da. I want one, two, three, boom. Okay. One, two, three. Good. I had a conducting teacher tell me, or rather, not tell, ask, ask the class, what, what can a, what can a conductor control? This might be a good question for Mr. Mark since he <laughs> does this. What, what can a conductor control? Time. Right, and that, that's Feel, that, you know, many things. Breathing. But what this was, uh, Steve Davis. I don't know if you know yes, Steve. Yeah. He's, he he claimed that all all a conductor could control was that first breath. Okay. And if if you are if you have the ensemble following you on that breath, the time will take care of itself in a way. It's probably a simple time. But um, in the same way, we're gonna control our breath in time, and then that will set everything else up afterwards for success. Okay. So let's bring it back to this piece. We're in three, four now, okay? Let's imagine we have two bars in, right? Whatever the piano's playing. So we're gonna go one, two, three, two, two, da, 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 okay? I'll count you off. Two, two bars in three, four. 
One, two, three, two, two. Good. And you did it perfectly in time. I want to see a little bit more embodiment of it. Let's just. Continue on just to two, just just until it repeats, okay? Just to see if, if we're able to take that sort of rhythmic stability that we're setting up internally before we start playing and allow it to just sort of spin its way out, okay? All right, one, two, three, two, two. <laughs> Beginning just felt a lot more locked in. What when I saw you first do it, it was that that earlier example where you sort of da -da -da. I mean, I, I'm pretty sure you can get as much air volume in in, in that one beat, at least as much as you need. Okay, cool. I, I'm I'm convinced about that. Let's go on to another part of the piece, okay? Um, and we're we're gonna come back to this opening gesture when it comes back. Um, let's go on to the soul part. And let me tell you this story. I, I had the exact same issue that you're having when I was the exact same age that you are right now, okay? Which is this. When you play loud, when you play full, you have a really nice warm sound. However, when you're asked to play quietly, it's harder to, to keep the sound warm and big when, when we're playing so quietly. And I want to I imagine like, I want to imagine like a, a hose you know, like with water running through it. And at it, when we're playing really, really loud, the hose is completely filled up with water, but and the water's coming out really fast, right? What What's going on right now, if, if, if we're using that same analogy or, or image in our mind, is that the water's coming out of the hose slowly, and because of that, it's not filling the entire hose up. It's just sort of like trickling along the bottom. Can you imagine that? What we have to do in order to get a, in order to fill that hose up, but not play loudly, is create some resistance in the hose, you know. And in this in this analogy, that hose is our our throat, our uh, soft palate, all the stuff you know inside here. And we need to create some resistance so that we're still filling that hose up, but we're not letting it. It's not going as fast, right? And so. Let's let's try to just play this first line, just with that in mind already, and then we'll start working on some things. So, how about how about you actually take the pickup? Start, let's start by really actively engaging our diaphragm. And, you know, we're not, when we're deflating the balloon, we're not just letting it go. We're, you know, actively squeezing it at a slower way. It's, it's quite tight here. I'm, I'm like really controlling the air as it comes out. Can we, can we try that? Um, you can just go on the like F sharp, F, F sharp, G. Good, good, good. Okay, now let's take that same idea and, and apply it when we have to play higher up, where it's even more free blowing and it's harder to control that. So we're still going to try to play quietly here. So. See if you can just do that and make, see if you can control your airstream enough so that we're filling that hose up, but not letting it just run wild and be a fortissimo. <laughs> Good. Okay. So part of the element is diaphragm support. Another, another part of the equation is embouchure support on the sides, not just top to bottom. Um, 
I have this, I have this uh, maybe weird theory that in order to make a sound on the saxophone, uh, you need to apply right, pressure, pressure um, in one of three ways, or, or you are applying pressure in three ways. And it's the ratio of how much pressure of each three of these that contributes to how well you're controlling your instrument, what your sound is like, intonation. And so the three kinds of pressure, I would say, we just talked about the first one, which is diaphragm pressure. The second one is vertical armature pressure, like biting the reed, right? And the third one is corners, okay? And, you know, if it's, it's, about, it's about how much of each you have, right? Like you can make a sound with like a whole lot of biting, some armature pressure, not a lot of corners, but it might not be the most round, beautiful sound, right? And so maybe we can try to add a little bit more corner pressure and a little less vertical pressure on the mouthpiece. And so an exercise, this is a really weird exercise, but um, one that I, I, I really like and I do myself nearly daily. Um, you said one of, one of these students is an oboe player? This one, this is for you. You're the one, my friend. Um, double lift long tones. And you know, you know, you know what double lift means, yeah. right? So you play oboe. Um, so this is an exercise I got from the clarinet player uh, Ricardo Morales, who's the principal in the New York Phil. And in clarinet playing, playing double lift is like a, a thing. Like there's a whole school of playing clarinet playing where they play double lift. Um, Ricardo Morales is not one of them, but he he says the practicing of double lift helps him sound better on single lift and have more more control. And, and for the parents that don't know what I'm talking about, what I'm talking about, on saxophone, we roll our lower lip over our teeth. On oboe, they also roll their top lip over their teeth. Um, on saxophone, it's our top teeth that are literally touching the mouthpiece. But what I'm, I'm challenging Matthias here to do is to use basically an, an oboe embouchure on a saxophone. And what that will do is it'll challenge us to use a lot more corners to support the reed. Um, because we literally would be biting into our <laughs> into our lips otherwise. Um, so we're, we're kind of taking away that crutch, okay? So let's just start in a normal register. Let's just try like, let's go chromatically up from like G. So what, what we'll do is we'll imagine whatever this tempo is and we'll, we'll hold it for four beats. So let me just demonstrate one time. And it's really hard to play off something like that. Um, and I think it also is a really great off exercise. So let's try it. Just G, start on G. Um, and this is this is truly weightlifting for our embouchure. Okay. Uh, ready? And. So we're going to actively like the opposite of actively <laughs> pushing air out. We're going to actively breathe in for four beats, not just a like we worked on at the beginning, but a, a controlled inhalation. So let's pick up where we left off, whatever that note that was. Doesn't matter. All right. uh, three, four. <laughs> sound is already improving. Um, I, I'm not suggesting that we play double lift at all. I, I think this is purely an exercise, but what we're doing is we're forcing our corners to engage more. And I, I think that will go a long way for you. I feel like more corner support. If we look at our pie chart of those three things, I would suggest adding a little more corner support and a little more diaphragm support and a little bit less this. And I think your sound will stay nice and big and full even when we're getting to these quieter dynamics so this is more of a, like a long-term thing that you know I, I i can't say all right now do it this time and can't we all hear how much better it is 
Um, but let's do that anyway. <laughs> um, so why don't we try uh, this this bar before seven? Okay. And then another one. Whatever. E da da da. All right. Ready? And. Oh, no, so, sorry, sorry. Uh, go back to the other way. Um, <laughs> that's just for our long tones, okay? Okay. And ready? And. So, so don't forget our diaphragm support. Okay. And then again. Ready? Yeah. Okay, good. It, it it already is sounding better to me. Um I think this is something we continually work on. Um I, I would suggest if you have an extra two minutes to spare and, and your warm up routine, just adding some double lip long tones to it. Um, and obviously, if you're playing oboe already, you have some of this some of the strength here built up. But I think it's a different feeling on the saxophone, yeah. and uh, applying it will will be different. Okay, um, cool. Um, next thing I want to talk about is planning our breaths out. Um, how 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 well would you say that your breaths are planned out in this piece? Not well. Yeah. So, uh, okay, second question. Um, you're basically playing with a tempo, maybe a hair under, but what? I wasn't trying to. Well, it's, it's close. But, so uh, that's my second question is like, how, is it just getting to this tempo now? No. I sped up in the beginning. Okay. That's the, that, I, you're, you're sort of answering my question, which is that, if you're not, um, if you haven't been at this tempo uh, for a while, um, it's it's tough to coordinate your breaths um, for a faster tempo if you're used to practicing at a slower tempo. Um, so what what I would suggest doing is you you just played it basically at tempo. I would suggest coordinating your breaths according to that tempo where you'll need them when you'll need to take in air, when you need to get rid of air, and then maybe add a few ones in parentheses for when you're practicing slower and you might need to take another break, breath. Um, but I think as a wind player, it's it's really, really important to have regular breaths. As I'm sure you know, string players will coordinate their bowings throughout, right? This is exactly that for us, right? Is knowing when to breathe, practicing the breathing, right? Um, I would I would uh, like to challenge you to get to the point with this piece where you cannot play it any other way, like with a breath mark in any other spot. You know, like it just feels it feels as wrong to play to breathe at a different spot as it feels to play a wrong note. You know what I mean? Um, that 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 I think is a, a discussion. So I just wanted to see if you had been planning this out. Um, it's it's sort of a discussion for like you should do this <laughs> not not like let's go through and do it but but let's let's maybe take let's maybe take the slow section that we just did and plan out our breaths okay so let's play it together okay are we breathing between the da 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 da, 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 da. are we breathing anywhere here no okay so you could if you wanted to i i, I mean i i wouldn't I wouldn't give you a failing grade or, you know, like, it's okay. I, I think if you if you wanted to, before the F sharp would be a spot, you could breathe. Um, okay, but if we're not breathing anywhere there, where's our next breath? I would, do you have a pencil? Yes. Okay. Let's take our first breath here. Okay. And and this this will be wrong if you don't breathe here. I'll I'll stop you just like if you play a wrong note when we go through. Okay. Um da 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 <laughs> right probably there. Or in, in, in one of these spots. Where, where do you think musically it belongs? Okay. Next one. Da 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 
da, da. Probably again, right? Da, 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 da. Okay, the next one's here, right? Yeah. Right on the note. Okay, so we, we breathe on the beat. Let's let's play it together and see if we can make all those breaths. Okay? So we'll start here. One, two. <laughs> musically where can I physically do it right um, and apply it to the whole thing right it's it's it, it's harder musically here um, but it's harder to fit it in elsewhere right okay how much time do we have about five plus one okay five. Cool. all right um, great let's let's go back to this opening thing do you notice the dynamics this time are different than this time. And it's a big difference, right? So let's try it. Let's try in both ways. Well, which way do you think is easier? Yeah, let's do that one first. Okay, so the difference here is that the second time around, there's no subito piano, right? Um, and and that, that's that's a tricky thing to coordinate. So let, let's try it again. We're going to... I just... I, this is our control, right? What we're, what we're looking for is on the previous page. But here, we're, we're, we're going to play for the audience what playing at mezzo forte is and sustaining mezzo forte, OK? Just like before, even though we're ralentandoing in, we're going to breathe in the time of the next thing, right? So even though we're going. <laughs> right, like our breath is not in the previous time, it's in what's coming forward, okay? So I'm gonna have you go, da, 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 and I want you to think in your head while you're playing this, whatever tempo you're playing, in your head is a different tempo you're thinking. And then you're gonna go, boom, right? You're breathing in time. So, so yeah, two bars before I do, please. Okay. And question, what dynamic did you end at? Hmm. Is it is it okay, it's interesting, right? Like he doesn't give us enough information. Is it there's a decrescendo into this thing? Does it decrescendo to mezzo forte? It, it's it's forte before. Mm -hmm. I don't think it, I think it decrescendos more than just one notch, you know? Yeah. And so use that breath in time, you know, it's, it's energetic and use it to prepare yourself to play a dynamic higher. I, I would suggest that it, it decrescendos quite a lot. If not to piano, maybe mezzo piano, but let's just write piano, okay? Um, so, and this first note, by the way, is still forte. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good. Well, I'm going to just ask you to do it one more time. Watch me do it, and I just want to show you, show you kind of how actively we're going to breathe. Right? Like four, 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 three. Forte, da, da. I'm going to make you do it again. Breathe in time. Boom. <laughs> I'll help you this time, though. Three, four, four, four. I'll do 
be three, four. That, so just so you're prepared. One more time. Last time. Three, four. Three, four. Okay. I'm convinced about time. Um, is that mezzo forte? No. Okay. Give me just just right on eighteen. Mezzo forte. Okay. Good. Let's go back to the beginning. This is the hard thing. This is now forte to piano. Big difference. Um, so let's hear, we just heard that as mezzo forte. Let's hear just the one notch bigger. Yeah, okay. And now the, the. Good, now let's take it down a little tempo. And I, I just wanna take it down so we can really exaggerate this. Good. Okay. So just to wrap up, because I know we're almost out of time, a few things. Dynamic differences. I think we can exaggerate them more. Actively thinking rhythmically before we start to play and using that to breathe and then prepare to play, pre prepare our, our, our air and prepare our, our self for playing, right? I think, I think that is, that might be the biggest thing you could take away from this and, and apply that to everything, scales, etudes, whatever. You're about to play your C major scale, three, four, da -da 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 -da, you know, breathe, three, boom. Um, this, this might be a little bit beyond the amount of um, like knowledge of saxophone repertoire that you have, but there's one of the big pieces for the instrument, um, this Albright Sonata, William Albright Sonata, maybe maybe some of you older guys have heard of this, but the, the first movement is like, it's it's at the exact same tempo as this 126, um, but it's not in 16th notes, so you don't hear this like, chuk, 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 chuk. you just, you hear, you go. I mean, do you hear 126 in there? Yeah. It's hard, right? And so to, to play it, really, you have to go, you have to feel time beforehand and breathe in time or else you and the pianist are going to be no. I mean, you have to be, I mean, you have to set that, it's the breath in that piece sets the whole thing up. And it's a really important lesson for that piece, but it's it's an important lesson that you can apply to every piece. And I think if you're, if you're able to take that like intensity of, of focus before you start to play and apply it to when you, to, to your breath before you begin to play, every, all the rhythmic stuff will be set up in time. Last reminder is about um, creating our own resistance on quiet things, right? And that's in our diaphragm, it's with corners, and uh, yeah, double lip long tones, but you're already set up with that as an oboe player. Mm -hmm. Nice to hear you play, Matthias. Thank you. Yeah. All right, next uh, we'll have uh, Jason Novolano uh, playing uh, Jason Bow. play the whole thing or uh i was gonna go till a little bit after the start of the finale if that's cool. yeah Thank <laughs> you. 
piece, Prelude, Cadence, and Finale, um, I, I almost like to think of it, or right, three distinct sections, very, very clear. Yeah. Um, I, I almost like to think of it in a way like a, like, a, like a Bach cello suite or something, right? Like a first movement is the prelude, right? And that sort of sets up everything that comes afterwards. Before I go on, let me just suggest one thing. I, I think you might want to, yeah, you're kind of like, see that, that. 
Um, anyway, uh, yeah, so I, I sort of think of this in the same way as a Bach prelude where a lot of what they set up here is seen in, you know, going on in the, in the subsequent movements. Um, and the best way I think to convey that is to present it um, in, a, in a kind of simple manner, or not a simple manner, but not an overly uh, rubato uh, infused manner. Um, and I, I, I still think even, even here, a, a strong sense of pulse, you know, and I think it's important that we don't come in on the downbeat, right? The, 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 the largest implied accent, right, is, is here every time, and the piano takes that each time, right? Yeah. And in every case, we respond off the piano. So let's try this where we imagine that this G is actually the first rhythmically important note, you know. To try to, I know it's hard, but to try to de-emphasize the low B and the low E. Yeah, yeah, uh, so that's the hard part, right? Um, let's just try to play it together one time, just to get a, a, a little bit of a sense of the rhythm of it, just uh, or my interpretation of the rhythm of it. And you see what I what I'm sort of doing in each one of these is they sort of I mean within its own thing it sort of it shells and then slows back down. And then as it gets longer, I think, I mean, we're talking about small amounts of stretching, but in the same way that dynamically we often will crescendo as the line goes up, I think it's, it's, a, it's also a very natural musical thing to a cell as the line goes up, right? And in that way, I think that's how we add the stretching and the pulling to it without making it feel like we've ever landed on a on a note and like it stops you know like we don't want the wheel to feel like it has square edges right like it can maybe be an oval you know <laughs> but <laughs> um and maybe that's what we're trying to maybe by by speeding up and slowing down within its own thing that's kind of what we're doing is the wheel is kind of that oval but it's always spinning you know it never stops okay um Let's try it. Let's try this next big long one. So here, and we'll go. We'll, we'll go to the next. So play it in. taper notes with vibrato and I'll just say it's we, we want to play with vibrato but at a certain point stop the vibrato so that as we're decrescendoing it doesn't just turn into right yeah. okay so let's let's try this can I have to go the vibrato and not go whoa yeah but don't go sharp Okay. <laughs> and and that comes back to like our, our pie chart thing of like as we taper the note, yeah. we don't add jaw pressure, we add corner pressure or some kind of other pressure, right? Um same same thing. Yeah. Nice. Okay. Um now let's get into the, the controversial topic of fingering choice. Okay. Um 
No. Yeah, I, I may, I may, I might say some things. <laughs> They're having a concert here at two thirty. Yeah, <laughs> I, I might, I might say some things that that um, Mr. Marx doesn't agree with, um, but yeah, we'll see. Maybe, maybe, maybe not. Um, I did my undergraduate with uh, Donald Senda uh, at the University of Michigan, and he's since retired. But you know, he's he was he was in his seventies when I was studying with him, and I remember playing this piece. Um, you know, you know the, you know these boats at etudes. And yeah, some. The, the the very first one um, goes, and the top note there, that's the, the opening. The top note is a is a E, like an E above the staff, right? And it comes from a D sharp, I think, a D or a D sharp. I, yeah. I um, it comes from a D sharp, and I it was one of my very first lessons with him. I played that, and I played it palm key, and he was like, "What are you doing?" <laughs> play that front and and the reason is, is you know that's what we do here you know at, at michigan is we play we play front front keys um and you know later on I, I was studying in europe and it was like playing front key what are you doing you know like we play side keys here um i would say as 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 i consider myself to be like a mature mature musician now um I'm I'm trying to di divorce myself from those like dogmatic opinions of like we do it's this fingering the other. yeah like we do this fingering because I was told to do it or because my teacher did it and I, I'm trying to become the guy that chooses fingerings based on a like a rationale or a reason of, that that is musical not that yeah. is because the guy told me to do it you know <laughs> um, exactly. So that's the background for all this, what I'm about to say. Okay. I probably wouldn't play a lot of this stuff front because I think that the most, um, I think a lot of these things speak better and sound better in context of coming from palm keys to go to palm keys than to go. <laughs> and you know, especially things like, I think there's a different sound quality there, you know? And I think we want to make those decisions based on number one, like how it sounds, number two, how easy it is to execute. And, you know, there, there's many more criteria like intonation, that sort of thing. But like, most importantly is how does it sound in context? What does it come from, right? What does it go to? Is, is my choosing that fingering make me and am I forcing the instrument into a register leap? Am I, you know, these sorts of yeah. things, right? Um, so <laughs> with that in mind, um, let's take a look at a few specific examples, okay? Let's take a look at this this one. Why don't you just play this G? E da da E da da. That's what you've written. That's beautiful. That's exact. Why why would you why does that one make the most sense? Because you, way, you're you're not changing the register. Exactly, you're not going across the break, right? Um, let's try this one. Look, so on this D sharp, da da di, da da, and do it as you were doing. Do it as you were doing. I would argue there that palm keys make the most sense going to because because a front key is another the next register break that is our altissimo you know i especially think there it reveals itself going to the e because e is especially a nasty sounding front key right um so th that yeah i mean but that happens yeah, clock, so, yeah. but that hap i mean that's why right um and so th this is exactly the type of choices that I'm talking about, and I, I don't, I don't want to tell you which ones to make, right? But I, just, I would just like to express how I would make these choices, right? I'm, I'm thinking number one, what makes the most sense musically? The first, that always has to be the first criteria, right? Like what's yeah. easiest, what's you know that that's first the sound, sound. What sounds? What sounds good, right? Because that's what we do, right? We make sounds, right? So <laughs> may as well make a good sound, right? Okay, um, cool. Um, and, and, you know, I don't want to point out 
different examples of, of places, but just that that in, in you know in mind as you go through, like, oh, would it make more sense to play whatever you know, or uh, like there? Exactly. That was that was exactly one. Yeah. So I mean, especially since you're you're wor you're working your way down, right? <laughs> It sounds like you put a put some sort of mask on, yeah. you know, over your instrument. So um, the reason I said Mr. Marks might disagree with me is because I know, yeah, it's a big front key advocate, as I was for the exact same reason because of who we studied with, you know. Um, but but like I we said, actually talking about that, like, yeah, why don't you? Yeah, I definitely advocate the front more. Yeah, yeah, and I, I mean, but he doesn't always say to use the front. He talks about that stuff a lot too, like why this time it's better, why this side is right, better. Right, right, right. And and so I think that, that that's like, that's that next level thing, right? Like that's that post-dogmatic, I did this because my teacher said, and I'm yeah. doing this because it sounds better. And I guarantee you, you will win every argument if you, <laughs> if you bring that up. <laughs> like they could bring up whoever famous pedagogue told them to say that. And you could say, I'm sorry, but the other way sounds better. End of discussion. Um, okay, cool. Let's go on to the cadenza. All right. First note. I, I want to not be quite sure. I know it says piano. I know it says piano, so you want to go, ta. But I, I want to not be sure where when your note starts. You know what I mean? I want to hear that taper. Exactly, and that was beautiful. I would, I would, I would, it, it, you know, first try. But I, I would let, I would let that establish itself before you go on. You know. necessarily like it's I think this, I think it can be louder you know virtuoso comes to the old master, you know, and, and plays for him. And the old master says, you need to add more windows to your play. Okay. And the, the young virtuoso goes off and, you know, studies at the Jedi temple for years and then <laughs> comes back and plays, plays for the old master again. And the old master says, I said, add more windows, not build a whole greenhouse, okay. you know? And so that's the trouble, right? In a cadenza, we need to find the balance of like, how much space to put in, but without going too far, right? Um, and especially something like a cadence of this magnitude that happens so early in the piece, right? Like it's on the second page. I don't know like yeah, how many pages, like eight or 10 or something like that. It's like a minute in. Right, it's like a minute in, bam, here, here's this big uh, virtuoso cadence. And the challenge is to, to like create the drama and to hold it that whole time, right? And so I think like those abilities to taper in on things like this, hit hit little, you know, really quiet pianos on these low C's and then let the sound kind of explode out of there. <laughs> Yeah, and, and so you can see how I'm 
like trying to just milk all the drama out of everything. You know, the, the staccatos are super short. And these things really, these little flourishes really have a life to them, you know? Um, the way I would practice that, I mean, it's easy enough to say that, but how do you practice that? Um, I think you take each one of these little elements, right? Like, what do I mean by like, here's like a little staccato thing as an element, you know? And you try to make, you just play that in, its, in isolation and try to make that sound interesting on its own, right? How do we make this? Like, what's the important thing, right? It's, it's this, right? But this still has to sound, you know, like a musical version of like a Lamborghini or something, right? So, <laughs> okay. Um, so let's, let's, let's work on a section just to get a little more drama out. And I think you did this really well. So let's, let's work on this. So we'll start on the low C, which is a forte. Actually, I'll have, I'll have you start here. Hold, hold the forte, right? That's, we never do this on the da, 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 da. forte, forte until the very end. Back in at forte, and then we're tapering, tapering. Is he going to continue? Is he going to breathe? No, he's not going to breathe. So why? Okay, let's try it right there. Let me see. <laughs> Sound we use like C4 there and then long. Yeah, long. yeah. I mean, I, if you were to make that argument for me, I would say that makes sense. I can see the I can see the logic there, right? Cool. Um, I know we're almost out of time, so I just wanted to, um, you know, reiterate just one thing here at the end. So, you know, just like here in the in the the low pianos, this is the same thing. The da da de, da da. It's the same thing down here. And then like a little critter, critter moving around. Back on the staple will be flat. Back to the little weird little animal moving around. What happens next? What comes next? You know, like the, the, there's this drama here. <laughs> These ones, the more, the more impactful like that. that is, yes. right? Yeah. yeah. So, I think these are parallel moments, right? And I know when I was learning this at your age, like those are the things I totally blew through. I spent all my time practicing this, and like that's that's the really interesting musical stuff. So you go, like time stops, right? Yeah. And you add that window to your greenhouse, right? <laughs> Okay, I think we're out of time, but it was, it was, it was really nice hearing you play. All right, last we have uh, Christopher Panulo uh, playing Ebert.
about the slow moment, um, I think an important part of this is knowing what what's going on in the other parts, right? And um, with, with that in mind, I want to talk about a slightly bigger picture thing, which is the fact that as saxophone players, or uh, as a wind player, we are guilty of one of the greatest sins in music, um, which is playing things the same dynamic for the entire duration of the note. Um, 
if you think about it, mechanically, we're really the only instrument that can do that, right? A piano, you hit it and immediately they crescendos, right? Um, a string instrument has a bow, right? And um, when you, right, the, the end that's closest to your hand is called the, the frog, and the end that's closest to the tip is called the tip. <laughs> um, and as you go from frog to tip, there's a natural decrescendo. As much as string players try to learn to, to fight that, you know, to, to be able to do it. And so just by the inherent construction of the, these instruments, there's, you know, dynamic flow built into it. And this is what you hear from, you know, middle school band ensembles, right? Just like block, 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 block dynamics, right? Because we can. And it's very easy to, um, but it it requires a little bit more musical. I mean, on our part, because it's not built into the to the to the way that the instrument works, it requires a little bit more forethought on our part, and also a little bit more knowledge of the other instrument. What's go, what else is going on, so that we, in a way, can go go in and write in our own bowings, so that we can create some of these um, dynamic, uh, you know, like micro alterations, right? Um, I think that a good a good example of that is going into 24, right? Obviously not important there, right? <laughs> um, in such like every note has a decrescendo on it. But if you know that something else is happening on top of you, you can get out of its way. And likewise, if you have a line like this, even though there's no, there's, not, there's nothing, no dynamic indication written underneath, we can put some in, right? We should, in fact, not now we can, we should, right? Yeah. Um, can we just try that? So um, do exactly as I did. in something like this yes it's a phrase mark it's not uh, is it a slur is it a phrase mark it's both you know um i think we we can use our better judgment and say like would a would, a, would an attack there sound better or not and i think maybe not um but good Let, let's let's keep going on exactly where we were with the same thing in mind right this time it's harder because we're playing up high right um and we want to be loud, but um, we want to make room as well. So like things like, we don't want to just hold it. We want to, and see somehow under this D, I still did something that was not a day crescendo, <laughs> you know? Um, so let, let's try here, uh, let's see sharp. Really nice, really nice. All right, next level. Ready? Check it out. Does a dynamic indication tell us how we should play the note? Or does it tell us how the note should sound? How the note should sound. Yeah, right? And we we get out of that frame of thought so easily, right? Mm -hmm. That, yeah, this, like, whatever note has, has a, a dynamic written under it, but the next note has the same dynamic written under it, so I play them the same way. Well, yes and no. Um, 
maybe if the notes are half step apart, could be, but on our instrument, on many instruments, certain notes sound louder than others, right? Mm -hmm. High register, does it sound louder or quieter than the middle louder. register? Yeah, right? So as we, as we take that extra thing into consideration, we have to, we have to think, okay, so I'm not gonna play the, the, the high palmy in the same way as I would play the E in the middle register, right? Mm -hmm. Which one do you have to play louder? The E in the middle register. Exactly, right? So with that in mind, can we try this again? And it's almost like you have to back off as you get higher just to make it sound the same dynamic, right? <laughs> quite good like I mean that was a very good decrescendo but until then all those notes sounded very even to me dynamically now that we we have that in our mind then we then we can apply the, the some dynamic phrasing to it right um, without it just being like loud notes pop out and middle notes uh, you know die in the oblivion um, cool that that's I think that's a really next level thing and something that you often don't discover until you start recording yourself more and more um, I, I, I know we're almost, you know, we're, we're getting close to getting kicked out, but I, I want to talk about one other part of the fast movement. Um, can, can I ask you to just play here at measure or marker 30 and just, just 30 to 31 and, and at a comfortable tempo. It doesn't have to be, doesn't have to be tempo. <laughs> recording by this uh, saxophone player Marcel Mule. Have you heard that name? I have. Um, and I remember like learning this piece and learning it a lot, listening to the recording, and like it's so even. It, like it, it's so virtuosic, and like the, the connection between the notes is so even. And as I was listening to that, I sort of had a realization that it's not just his hands that are even, right? It's like his air directionality is so even and like constantly going forward, which is allowing these notes to connect so much, you know? And I would, I, I would, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna offer two bit different ways to work on this section. The first way is, is, is very slow, but like with like 95% of your mental energy just dedicated to your airstream. And this idea of your airstream always moving forward, you know? <laughs> mental energy is just dedicated to connecting those notes by our airstream being relentlessly driving forward. Can you just try that that, that tempo? You can just go there. It's like diaphragm pressure, you know? Nice. And I mean, yeah, immediately the not only is it technically cleaner because it's slower, but the connection between the notes, like the linearity of the notes, is is immediately apparent. You don't, you know, on saxophone you can have those like, da, like weird in between sounds, and we're just eliminating that. Okay. The last thing I want to talk about is another way to practice this, which is not this, but half notes. Can we try that? Da, dee, da. I think that that's a better way to play this. It just encourages more like longer thinking, right? And and you could even, you know. 
That's too far, but you know, you're you're again getting rid of a crutch, right? You're you're you have one every beat. Let's eliminate one of those. Let's eliminate another one. You know, yeah. and it, it not only makes you more responsible for your timing, um, you know, your internal timing, because you don't have the the regular hammer beating on your head, um, but it also makes you, I think, think longer line, right? Yeah. And and to me, maybe it's because we just worked on some more diaphragm stuff, but it sounded so much more connected um i think i think that's a really good exercise for you know anytime anytime you're just you know uh going into like a locomotion on on some 16 does it's really really nice to to take away one of those one of those reinforcements and it'll i think make it sound less vertical like this anyway um i think that's 230. can we, can we go a little bit longer? oh sure sure I, I, we, we, oh, we had a little bit of later to start so, I, I, I just saw, of course, I just saw the thing and I was worried that we're going to get kicked out. Yeah, no problem. Okay. Let's talk about cadenza. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, my general feeling on the altissimo in this piece is to not do it. <laughs> um, <laughs> except, except the one in the first movement up to the A. That's the only one I would do. Um, you know, this is this is from an era when, like, I mean, this this is maybe the quintessential piece from that era when, like, Altissimo was an extended technique. It, you know, it no longer is, and it was like a fire. You know, it's like here's the the shiny thing. Look at look at the shiny thing. How high I can play, right? Yeah. Um, and I think it's it be, it's become less of that. Um, I, so I personally, I mean, just, just to suggest, I, I personally would just play the normal register run. Um, no, no pressure on, on you, but let, let's go back. Um, can, can we just go right on the cadenza? <laughs> First, actually, like try to learn it as rhythmically notated, and if we can, if we can reproduce it as no notated, then we can mess with it and stretch it and add the drama. Um, I, I would suggest the first thing you do, and we all do when we're um, learning a cadenza, is, is put it on the metronome. You know, just so that the the proportions, you know, are 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 honest, right? Um, because these and, and and these are just going to be twice as fast, right? So. Likewise, let's go on here. 
short staccatos but i think you might have played them too short at 30. Yeah. um let, let them let them have duh, duh. i think there's a little lightness to those you know um especially since they're piano can we try those and then we'll try these forte ones <laughs> short staccato without the if you don't want it you know and i think here you don't want it yeah um but yeah it sounds really good i'm sure you're gonna have a great audition 
and best of luck with all that. Thanks. You're welcome. Thank you. 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 Thank you.